excited to show you this. I don't know if you've already seen it. Um, it's a really interesting way to present ideas to your class. It's not a complete presentation tool, um, but it's really good for plenary starters, at the end of topics, if you're doing a, like a revision session on a certain um, process. It's, it is expensive. It's, um, if you can see on your pack, it'll tell you the price from the App Store and on the Android Store. Um, but it is worth it. That is not my hand. Um, I'm going to show you, I wanted to do the video scribe for you to show you all the features. And one of the features is a voiceover. So I won't be talking at the front. You really will hear a dreadful voice coming through the speakers, so I can only apologise. So I'm going to turn the lights off and I'll press play. Welcome to my video scribe. The surefire way of preventing boredom in the classroom. So, do you feel like you use the same programs all the time? Do your kids see the same presentations over and over? We love them, but do we overuse them? You know them. PowerPoint, Prezi, YouTube. They're all great and stop us from talking so much, but there are other ones out there. As a teacher, we need to have a lot in our teacher's toolbox. Things that keep the kids entertained, but most of all engaged and learning. Well, Video Scribe is a new presentation tool on the market out there to make your lessons really exciting. Do you know what? It's a really easy tool as well. It really is as simple as downloading the app, creating your video scribe on your iPad, iPhone or Android, creating a voiceover and turning it into a video that can be displayed on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook or just displayed in the classroom. It really is an exciting way to develop your teaching. I love it and I'm sure you will. It's really easy to use. Um, you download it, you create it, you turn it into a video. If you want to put a voiceover on, you can. If you'd rather not, you can play some lovely classical music in the background, help to culture the children. Um, <coughs> and it really is as simple as that. You can upload it to YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, whichever social media that the students use. Um, and it just, they look at it and it's, it's a different way of seeing things and a different way, a visual way of learning new things and I think it's quite exciting. Obviously not going to end, but it's exciting. Right. right, okay, I've got a bit of a challenge for you. If you turn over to the second page in your pack, uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about something called Socrative. Now I don't know if you, if you know anything at all about this, but to summarise, it's basically an online assessment for learning tool. Absolutely fantastic if you use as either a starter activity during the lesson just to uh, ensure that the students have understood something that you've, you've uh, taught them. It can be used at the end in the plenary. Um, uh, it's a fantastic tool. It, students can use it by accessing a website either on a laptop or on their own mobile phone. And obviously, that as a school, that's something that we have been looking into how we can take forward the students' own device, uh, the bring your own device. Uh, if you've got your phone with you, what I'd like you to do, please, is to imagine that you are the student. At the bottom of the packet tells you to go to m.socrative in your, the, in your browser. If you can do that, and while you do that, I'll show you what you would do if you are the teacher. So you're going to be the students for now. It, the first page, if you were to log in as a student, should ask you what room number. So I'd like you to put in room number 555-1555, which is always my teacher room number. And you, you can change that as well. All right, brilliant. Okay, so uh, as a teacher, you can have this displayed as a class. Uh, if you look, you have to have an iPad. There's an iPad app as well, although you don't need that by any stretch of imagination. That just means you can walk around and you could, you could have it on here. Uh, so this is what you would see as a teacher. You would know exactly how many students are logged into your virtual room. Um, uh, 
down here you'll see that there are different things you can do in the class. I can verbally ask a question to the class. It might just be something as simple as, can you tell me something that you've learned this lesson? And on their mobile phones or on the laptops, the students will just type in their answers. So I'm going to say something to you. So the question for you will be, can you, can you write down one interesting thing that you've done today with, with the class? Okay? Or I'd like you to type in your answer and then just press it. Everyone will see you <laughs> Well, there is a feature, I can hide this, so your, your, your class is really <laughs> <laughs> And it's a bit like a text response, so the class can see straight away. You can have a bit of a, a quick glance about where, what, where the kids are in terms of progress as well. Um, so right now it tells me that I've had three responses from Alex. <laughs> And if you, if you have a response that you're not happy with, you can cancel the response down just by... Um, although there's, there's lots of things on here, you can, pre you can preset quizzes. So if you've got a few minutes beforehand, you can go on and set uh, three or four questions ready. So the kids just literally log in, they put their name, um, and then they work through their questions. And then Socrata will actually email it to you as an Excel document, so you can go on with it, uh, in it later. Uh, a really good one is the true or false. Um, so then you would ask the class true or false question, um, and then the students just respond on their phone, and then from that, that can be, um, it can be a judgement about their learning, but also it can prompt questions. So then you can start by saying, you know, <coughs> ten of you have said yes to this question, why? And it's, it, can, it can open up discussion. Um, so we'll give it a go. Um, do you think that if the Socratic would be something you could use in the next week? Another feature that we use a for, there, there's something called an exit ticket. And we are going to be looking at exit tickets at the end, but this is an online exit ticket that has just got preset questions. Can you rate how, how much you've understood the content of this lesson on a scale of 1 to 5? Tell me one thing that you've learned. And then again, I can email it to you, ready, ready as a prompt for next lesson. So that's something like that is absolutely fantastic as a starter. Um, so you've got the pack anyway, it's got the website on. Please give it a try in the next week because it's so fantastic and the kids respond so well to it. All of the things that we're going to talk about tonight are hopefully things that we can use in the classroom to, um, to help engage the students. Bloom's taxonomy, so it's got your higher order and your lower order thinking. You've got six coloured dice, each of them deal with the different um, aspects of Bloom's taxonomy. So you can differentiate your lessons straight away. You can ask the simple questions for your lower ability, you can ask the higher order, so you can get more able to tell them in there, your SEN's in there, uh, loads of differentiation through them. So you've got six different dice. I don't know, I don't, you know, I don't need to go through them all. I'm sure you've seen Bloom's taxonomy anyway, but that's all on there. But just showing you the different levels. So obviously if you're using the yellow dice in your lesson, it's levels two to three, so it's simply recalling information. You can use that in the starter to show prior learning, so if you're getting observed or if you just want to have a good lesson anyway, or outstanding. Um, you can be using that at the start of the lesson to get them thinking about what they already know, what they've learned, learned prior. Right towards the end of a project or a lesson, if you've made really good progress and you want them to evaluate the lesson, you'll be using your level 7 plus, which is your evaluating dice blue. So you can change all the way through, keep using them again. You can use the evaluation at the end of a mini task, so you can use it for mini plenary. You just jump back and forth between the colours and effective way of questioning. So you can use them at any point in the lesson. If you want to check that they've understood an instruction that you've given them, you could use the orange dice. You can throw them and say, right, put in your own words what I've just told you to show that you understand it. Um, they're really good for inquiry-based learning because you can actually use one of the dice and get to the purple one for um, forward planning creativity. So you actually set them a, a, a task, like an essay question, and then get them to forward plan what would you do if you were going to study this topic. If I'm not going to teach you it, what would you do to find the answer? So you're actually getting them to think about the way that they learn. <clears throat> Again, as I said, you can use them at any point of the lesson whatsoever, jumping backwards and forwards, mini plenaries, everything like that. But it's getting the kids to start thinking about questioning themselves. So rather than you standing at the front simply asking them a question, getting the dice out there makes them formulate the questions themselves, 
and then their friends and their, their peers and they can answer them for them. So as I've said, yellow dice, use it right at the start of the lesson to think about what they've already learned. Literally throw it into the class, get a student to, to catch it wherever their thumb lands, that's the question that they have to answer or they can ask their friends a question based on what it says um, and then just keep passing it around. Orange dice, check and understand of the project, uh, the project as I've said, so what have I given you the instructions for, can you put it into your own words, uh, can you explain how we can solve this problem. Blue evaluating, any task that they do whatsoever, you can get them to evaluate the success of it, what would you do differently, how would you change it, um, how would you go about doing this next time. The peer assessment one is quite nice, I thought, you can get them to actually pick the assessment. <coughs> I've got six tables in my room and I've got the six dice and what I do is I put one on each table, I get five minutes per table and then they, they, they move them around um, clockwise so that every table is getting the board at each different dice and they've got to think of the question for themselves. This one's a really good technique. If you're actually looking to assess them at the end of the module, you could sit a couple of students down and have a little discussion so it's improving speaking and listening straight away anyway. But you're monitoring them using the dice, you're not speaking to them whatsoever, you're just sitting as a, an observer. And certain students will be able to answer questions from all of the, different, the six different dice. Some students will struggle and you can use that as a, as a basis of assessment. So if you go back to what we had with the Bloom's taxonomy, if they're only using a, a small number of the dice, you can see what level that would take them up to. So you've got your order of thinking skills and you can actually see roughly what level they're at just by the way that they answer questions and even the asking of the questions as well. And if you want to find out more, you can go onto that website there. As I've said, they're only 5 99 Now, the problem with them is you notice a few of them, the words do rub off after extended use if your hands are a bit sweaty. So <laughs> I'd, I'd recommend that you don't hand them too much. Once they've thrown them, put them down on the desk um, or spray them with some sort of lacquer or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> um, what I'd like to talk about is an idea called um, the marketplace. It's um, something I learned about when I was doing my PGC in Newcastle, and then something um, the EST preached to us about nine years ago, now eight years ago. The idea is that uh, group work and really teaching with the right group. All you really need is um, suitable information for your class, some sugar paper, and some highlighter pens or pencils. And the way it would work would be as follows. I would advise splitting a group in a class of state 30 into groups of three or four. The groups would then get information on different topics. So, for example, in history, we might give a breakdown of different crises leading to World War I. Um, the groups would then have to summarize the information using pictures, diagrams, and then words. But the words would usually have a limit. Now that works really well with like differentiation because if you've got a group that's lower ability, you can obviously make the word count higher and you can choose the topic they get. If you've got a group that's higher ability, you can actually make the word count lower and obviously choose the topic they get as well. But at the same point in time, it can also work quite easy differentiation wise by putting a gift in a target or a higher ability pupil in a group where you want to pull it up. And the idea is thinking outside the box. So if you were going to like talk about France in World War One, my year ten pupils would probably be drawing a picture of the Eiffel Tower or Frog's Legs or something to be associated with France. To stop having to write Russia, they might draw a bottle of vodka. I don't know why they would know about that in year ten, but there you go. Um, the idea from there would be that they would create a presentation, so they've got a summary. And that summary is explaining in as much detail as they can without breaking the word limit in that particular area they've been asked to summarise or the answer to a question. After the time's up, one person stays at the market stall. The rest of the pupils from their group would then circulate around the marketplace with their exercise group, summarising, <coughs> basically being peer taught the answer to a question or a summary and writing it down. They would then go back to their groups when the time's up and then it becomes the job of the rest of the group to pay and teach the person who's staying at the market stall to explain. So you're getting really for, I would say, a very little preparation time as long as you've got the suitable text levels and a lesson with pay and teaching um, which can use differentiation in a mixed ability class or a higher ability or a middle ability class. I wouldn't recommend it. I've tried it with more ability. It doesn't work as well. Um, and it's very, very easy to plan. 
and as long as you have some exercise to write about afterwards, such as a homework, which I'm pleased everybody will be delighted to hear about when mentioning, um, it's very, very easy, very, very straightforward, and it does work. Um, I've used it in history, I know Grimm's used it in geography, I know Dan's used it in PE, um, and as long as you pick your class right, you pick your information right, it can work very, very successfully. Now, if anyone would like me to go through examples of that, or explain further, I'm based in the, uh, the Mount of Oak at the back, it looks a bit like I'll be the same pet. You just want to walk across at any point on lunch, I'm more than happy to take you through it further, but it is very straightforward and it's Okay, thanks very much. Okay folks, um, I want to talk a little bit about something that, to be honest, I only became aware of a few weeks ago, um, and it, it's something called TED Ed. Now, TED um, was basically created, it's a, it's a non-profit organisation that was originally created just to, just to share interesting ideas in, in, in a variety of different businesses, um, and they've now branched into TED Ed uh, recently where the, the aim basically is to try and, and share lessons from across the world um, in, in an easy to use easy to use way. So kind of lessons that primarily at the minute come from America, um, but are, are trying to kind of share those with, with teachers uh, and obviously with students as well. I want to see if the, the actual tour video is going to work um, because it explains everything that we need to know, but I think we're like a little bit Welcome to the TED Ed Beta website tour. I'm Logan Smalley. I'm Betterhan Sanar. I'm Jordan Reeves. And I'm Stephanie Lowe. We represent the TED Ed team. We're going to tell you about how the TED Ed website is organized. About the lessons that surround each video. How you can customize or flip your own lesson. And how you can measure that lesson's effect on your class or the world. Towards the end of the tour, we'll reveal one more major feature that directly affects every person viewing this video. Let's get started with the home page. On the home page, you'll find original TED Ed videos. Each is a lesson recorded by an actual educator that's visualized by a professional animator. You can nominate educators and animators in the Get Involved section of the site. The TED Ed library can be browsed through two different lenses. Learners can use the series view to browse videos thematically and based on their own curiosity. And teachers can use the browse by subject view to find the perfect short video to show in class or to assign as homework. Every video on TED-Ed is accompanied by a lesson. These lessons don't replace good teaching, but they can be supplementary resources for students and teachers around the world. Let's look at this one, created by a teacher in the US and an animator in the UK. When you arrive on the lesson page, simply click play. The video will continue to play as you navigate the lesson sections that surround it. In the quick quiz section, you'll find multiple choice questions that check for basic comprehension of the video. You get real-time feedback on your answers, and if you get one wrong, you can use the video hint. You'll find open answer questions in the think section, and in the dig deeper section, you'll find additional resources for exploring the topic. You can complete the lessons anonymously, but if you log in, you can track your own learning across the site. Just visit the recent activity feed and you'll find answers you've saved to lessons that you've already started or completed. And now to one of the most powerful features of the TED-Ed website, flipping a lesson. Flipping a featured lesson allows you to edit each of the lesson sections. You can edit the title as it relates to your class. You can use the Let's Begin section to provide instructions or context for the lesson. You can select or deselect any quick quiz question. In the Think section, you can add your own open answer questions. And in the Dig Deeper section, you can use the resources provided or add your own. When you finish flipping a lesson, it'll publish to a new and unique URL. And because the link is unique, it can measure the progress of any learner you share it with. You can use it to measure participation and the accuracy of any individual student's answers. So that's how you flip a featured TED-Ed video. But we've got one more major feature to tell you about. Using the TED-Ed platform, you can flip any video from YouTube. That means you can create a lesson around any TED Talk, any TEDx Talk, but also any of the other thousands of great educational videos on YouTube, including the ones that you yourself could record, upload, and flip. And through flipping these lessons, together we'll create a free and remarkable library of lessons worth sharing. Yeah. Um, as you can hear from the voice so it's very, very Americanized at the minute. Um, and a lot of the subject areas and a lot of the um, a lot of the ways in which they classify lessons do seem to, to fit an American curriculum rather than the UK one. I have been in touch with, with Ted Ed and kind of 
almost suggested that you know, a group of UK teachers, do, as we need to kind of organise a UK version of TED Ed, and I've been very kind because I've got so much time available, um, put myself forward to be able to do that. So that is something that would happen in the future. I think there's great scope to use this. All right? I think particularly if if it starts to fit the, the UK curriculum model, it could really help. At the minute, there's only around about 200 videos on there that have been a combination of a, an animator and a teacher collaboration. And, and visually, they, look, they do look tremendous. And if you can find one that fits, I've had a look at a few, and obviously, I've looked at English now, and I've used some in media myself. But there's some great things on there for English and maths. In terms of for your subject, what I would suggest is go on and just see what at the minute fits for you. But I think the real power at the minute is the fact that um, I think the real part of the minute is the fact that you can you can use any YouTube clip to actually create a really good lesson, and I've done that. Search any YouTube video that you use at the minute, and you can use that. And, and I really like the idea of um, of the questions that they create at the bottom because, to be honest, I do use YouTube videos a lot, but I I created from from a from a YouTube video. I created a lesson for my, for my year 10 media class in about 15 minutes with closed questions for, for, for slightly kind of lower ability students, open questions for kind of more talented ones and it was done in 15 minutes and that lesson is there again if I want to use it with a different class as well uh, and obviously that comes from the fact that you, know, you have your think questions and you also have your deep deeper ones as well. Um, I've had a chat with Don because obviously we, we have a situation at the minute where YouTube is blocked for students. Um, there is a potential at some point when, when Don can solve the firewall issues for, for pupils to be able to access YouTube on netbooks, on, on tablets, on phones, um, and in the LRC as well. So I think when we're trying to think about um, decent cover lessons to leave and also kind of trying to use um, homework in a slightly more creative way, I think TED Ed might fit that uh, quite perfectly as well. What I would suggest is have a little go at, at flipping a YouTube video. Right? Take any video that you've got at the minute, um, go to where it is YouTube at the top, or you will have to register but it's free, where it is YouTube at the top, click on that, find your video, click on flip, and then just try to just, just basically add some questions to it. You can just use it at the front, but it's much more powerful if you actually use it with the students actually being able to answer the questions themselves, because then you can access the, 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 the kind of um, the data of the students, like we do with I Am Learning, where you can see how many answers they're getting right and whether the pupils actually do have a grasp on the topic. Please give it a go. If you've got any questions about it, please come and see. All right, thank you. If you've got a phone or a laptop or something to work, if you go onto this second address in the browser, so not the top one, because for some reason not the long, which is great, really helps me promote it. But the second one where it says 9H1 birthday, and you have to type it into the browser, not Google. The World Wish is an online homework setting thing that the humanities department, we've started to set most of our homeworks on it now, as well as I am learning just because we're sick of getting scrappy little bits of paper pulled, scrumpled out of the blade pocket. At least this way they're nice. People got it written down. Hands up if you've got it. Right <laughs> Can I turn over? It blocked. The kids can get on it. So this is what it looks like. This is one that I've customised myself um, for my. 9H1 history class, and I, as you can see there, I've set the homework, and if you've got it on your phone or your iPad, you can see it too. And so Iman's been really keen, and she's already put a homework on, which is there, and I've put the website, I've put where they wanted, I wanted to go and research it, and then Iman's done the homework. Someone who has not put their name on their homework, <laughs> yeah, so I will assume that they've not done their homework, has also, and if you can see there, I'll just go this one. I can actually remove it or approve it depending on, so it means that if you get someone really clever, Alan Metcalf asked the question like, Miss, what if I want to swear all over the wall? I said that I can actually, it remains private, private is unless I've approved it, so if you're on a phone or if you've managed to get on it, all you can see at the moment is Iman's answer, you cannot see that other answer that's in red, because I haven't approved it yet, because I've set myself up as moderator, 
which means number one, you can see if they're copying each other and not let, not post it. Number two, it stopped um, them sort of writing anything inappropriate. Well, it didn't stop them writing it, but it stopped them writing anything inappropriate publicly. And I've also lied and told them that I can find out which computer it was from, which they don't know. It's not true. And secondly, it means that you can, I know that Amy's been using it, but she doesn't necessarily want everyone to see them right away. So it means that you can just keep a little bit more control over it and maybe just put up some good ones as examples for the rest of the students. So Iman's was a good one, so I've got it there. So some of the weaker kids in the class, if they're not sure what to do, they've got an example there to look at and see what they can do afterwards. And you tend to see that they get better from the first post and the more and more there are, the better they are. Um, so it's really easy to use. You just go to wallwisher.com and sign up. And then when, once you've signed up, you have a wall that's blank initially. And then on your account, you can sort of customise it. Just use this tool. It's, it's really self-explanatory. But this modifying is the most important one because you can make it look pretty, number one. And privacy, you can make it private. So you can make it password protected, but that's just a bit faffy because the kids will forget it. What you can do instead is as long as you click on what direct post, you are in control of that. And I've made sure that mine's hidden so you can't Google it, which means that no sort of random people can find it because they have to type exactly the right address, which again, you can customise here. So you can change the address and make that address unique to you and your class. So I've got different walls set up for different classes and that's always the address that they have, so that's their wall wisher address and that's where they go. And I have used it in lessons when I've managed to have a computer access and they've all logged on and they've started posting research as they've been doing it, but it does get a bit manic because you have to sit there like approving them all and it's a bit stressful. So if you're in the LRC with that big screen on the wall, it's quite hard, but I think I imagine if you had your own computer, it'd be a bit easier to control. Um, but it is really good, I would really try it. The humanities staff who have been trying it have really liked it and the kids love it, especially year seven, they get really excited. But um, I recommend it, all the information on the handout, if you need any more ideas, let me know. Today we learned about the angle of refraction in action and how the instant ray works. The instant ray goes into the glass block and comes out at a small angle. This is called the refracted ray, refracted angle. The the angle inside is gone gone small because of the air around it is more dense. Now we have a question for you. If the angle of incident is 50, what do you, do you think the angle of refraction is? Right, now obviously they made that video themselves. Now what I do is I've got two year eight classes that are a very similar ability. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna play that video for my other year eight class. They're gonna try and answer the question. And also there was um, a mistake in there. Caitlin said the wrong thing about the air being more dense. So what I would hope is that the other class recognize that. So you could obviously that wasn't a deliberate mistake. She actually just said that. So you'd have to correct that. But um, you can use it in loads of different ways. You can do it as plenary. I was gonna play it as a starter. Um, just basically using video to sort of make the kids more interested and you'll find particularly low ability, particularly lads, funnily enough, will really want to be on the camera and they'll really want the hassle. Yeah, miss, come, come and play the video, come, as soon as they get in the door, they want them to come on. Um, it's just a way of sort of engaging them a bit more and just a little idea that I had. So if you have any questions, let me know. <laughs> Like Michelle, I'm not going to pretend I've invented countdown timers or anything like that. They, and I know that you've probably all used them at some point in your teaching. Um, it was just really to sort of reiterate the fact that actually they're, they're pretty good, I think. 
and they're pretty useful. You've got all sorts of benefits you can get from them. You can give pace to any lesson. You can make um, can keep kids on task very easily. You can give them a set amount of time to work, and so on. They're also, which I'm sure you all be really, really pleased to know, they're a really good way to get numerous into your lesson. Because you can talk really quickly, really easily, just about conversion between minutes, seconds, things like that. And that's just already there. You know, there's some numeracy in there. You've ticked a box as well, which is good. Um, I'm going to show you this one that I found online uh, that I've started using. Uh, it appeals to me because it's, I just think it's really good fun. If you go onto, the website's in your handout, but if you go onto here and just type in class tools. And I think it says time And it comes up with. Now, funnily enough, when I did this on mine before, it was the first thing that was there. And now it's even We'll have a look. We'll have a look. There it is. Count down time, just at the top there. Now, I really like this one because you can set a time, but you can also set a soundtrack which I think just adds a little bit of fun. So today, for example, I had my year eights doing some work on a sort of like a paired activity. I gave them sort of about 15 minutes, but I set the last 30 minutes just to be the countdown music. So obviously they straight away knew as soon as they were getting there. And it was amazing how they were picked up at that point in those last 30 seconds. So it just comes out and just plays. I won't play the whole thing. The great thing is that there are there are some fantastic choices, um, and you can upload your own as well from there. My particular favourite is making tidying up time for Year 7 really good fun. So you give Year 7, they've made a right mess, and you tell them, right, you've got a minute to tidy up. And you can just type in there, you can change that to one minute, and you say, right, you need to tidy up, go. Um, but it's just that, it's just to make that timing just that little bit more fun, a little bit more interesting. And that's it. And now we're going to try it, I believe. Well, we are just going to try This is how we seamlessly yeah, mix good. literacy and numeracy yeah. together. And it's just wonderful, isn't it, Richard? It's so much fun. Right, I've handed out, I'm hoping everyone's got so. I've handed out packs. So can you work with so that at least three or four of you can see one pack? You don't have to have your own subject area. It doesn't matter. If you can take them out, what we're going to do is... Uh, uh, right, okay, class. Right, this is We, you are going to be giving the opportunity, and this is what you could do with your students in class. It's a way of introducing a topic. It can be a mini plenary to see how far they've got. But it's an opportunity for them to explore their own oracy skills, their own speaking and listening to each other using visual aids. Not unlike the marketplace that Gary's already used. Okay, now what you've got in there is you've got four images linked to a particular subject. Your images could be to do with your subject, they could be to do with anything whatsoever. And what the students in their little groups have to do is identify connections, similarities, anything that they want to talk about. But what we need to do, it's not just enough to say to the kids, right, okay, we're going to talk about those images, because that's just going to go anywhere. What we need to be able to do is help them to structure their own talk. But before that, we need to give them thinking time. And sometimes we don't forget that students, kids, need thinking time. So we need to give them thinking time, but we also need to give them the prompts of what they are going to say, as well as the key words, the key language that you use in your subject, so that actually when they're coming back to us, they're feeding back the, the appropriate language for speaking and listening, but also for your subject, okay? So what I would like to do, and then at the end of this little exercise, the group would ideally come together and summarise, again a bit like Gary said, but summarise very briefly with one spokesperson what ideas they've come up with, what connections, links they have made with those topics. Now I'm going to ask one or two at the end of this if we have time, but we are going to give you, how long shall we give you? Two minutes. Two minutes. So, some nice relaxing background music. Two minutes. Kerry. <laughs> right, could I have a summary still? <laughs> what, what, what have you sort of gleaned from those images about English? About geography. About geography. Well, they all have really so linked by the colour and it represents the earth and recycling. <laughs> what do they represent the earth? Just it's geography? And that was from everybody? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Could I have, ask science? Who's got science? Um, 
Right, I'm just going to quickly talk to you about Poplet. So it's quite similar to Anne's wall wisher, um, but it's more of a visualisation tool um, to straightway differentiations in there already. Um, excuse the title on this, it is not subtle, it's tectonic plates. <laughs> Uh, I my mind up to For me, this has been more beneficial with my lowest, um, lower ability classes and also this example here, revision for GCSE. Um, it's really, really easy to use. So, once you've registered to the poplet, you create this page. I think, I think you do have to buy into it, but you get to create up to five and you can just delete them once you finish. Really straightforward to create, so by clicking on this, uh, saving your update, so to create a new popple. <laughs> and then you uh, so you get this box here. Um, it's ideal for creating like a mind map. Um, you can include on there your link, your images, sorry, drawing, text, and you can also change the colour of these. So if I go back out into the do now. And, uh, um, so, for example, I've put the, the topic there and then done each section in a different colour so it links. You can also then, um, once you've published this, similar to the wall wisher, kids can comment. So, for example, there was a question there, so where would you find an oceanic trench? And the kids reply, once you've pub you do have to publish it, and it's exactly the same as wall wisher, you get a link. Um, and then they can reply, and again, exactly the same, you approve it or not. Um, but it more, especially for me, it's been more beneficial with lower ability sets um, and ideal for revision. And that's it. Thank you. Hi there, this is John Taird and we're going to look at the use of QR codes in education. I'm going to take you through how to create the codes, how to scan them and then some fantastic crowdsource ways in which to use them in your classroom. So, what are QR codes? QR codes, short for quick response codes, enable a user with a smartphone to scan the code and be immediately directed to a website or a piece of text. This is becoming increasingly popular with advertising and marketing companies and as we know is now coming into education. So, let's look at how we create a code. Okay, what you'll see here is I've opened Google, uh, you can open any search engine you like and what we're going to do is I've just searched here for QR code generator and you can use any of the any of these uh, websites here, you'll see they'll all come up with free, um, free tools. The one I've used is this first one here um, and if we just click on that one and it takes us to this website here. All I've done very simply is I've actually inputted my blog here, so my, the URL I wanted to uh, generate the code for in this box here. And what it does, once I've clicked generate the free QR code, it generates the QR code here. And this can then be saved as a JPEG. And once you've got it as an image, as a JPEG, you can then use it wherever you want, uh, in posters, in Word documents, um, and you know it, it's, uh, it's, it, it's easy to do what you want with it. Okay, once you have generated your QR code, you need a piece of software to be able to scan it and read it, and so do your students, so your users. This image I've got here on the screen is just an image of the App Store, uh, of specifically the iPhone App Store from Apple, and it shows there are numerous free scanners. Um, and all I've done here is just at this top right, I've just searched for QR code reader, and you can see that we've got quite a few there. Uh, they're all free and easy to use. And um, if you want to do that now, you can pause the video, you can go into the App Store um, and download a free um, scanner for the iPhone. Also, you can do this in an Android um, Android Store uh, if you've got an Android device. 
And if you want to do that now, that's great, because I'm going to show you a QR code on the next page which you can scan. Right, this is the QR code I generated uh, via the previous screen through the, the website. This QR code scans straight to my blog, edutate.com. So if you want to pause the video now and scan it just to see how it works, feel free to do that and you will see it take you immediately to the blog. And then if you think about the possibilities of that taking you to whichever website you want to take them to, whether it be a website, whether it be YouTube, whether it be a piece of text, you can start to see the possibilities um, of using these in and around your classroom and your school. Okay, earlier when I uh, when I thought about doing this presentation, I decided that the best way of generating some ideas was to put a request out on Twitter through my teaching network. And I had some amazing uh, responses within an hour of some uh, crowdsourced ideas of how to use them in your classroom. Now this may be a point where you want to pause the video and really have a look at in detail about some of these ideas that have come from classrooms around the world um, of how QR codes are being used to engage students. Now the, we had to run to two pages because there were so many fantastic ideas. What I will say is that when you're looking at these, you need to think about really how we use QR codes and what are they what, what are they used for. Well, specifically I think you need to think about how can we engage our learners, how can we create curious um, and inquisitive learners that you know that want to know more about the subject and want to learn independently. Um, if we can create independent and inquisitive learners then that's half the battle in our classrooms and some of these uh, some of these ideas here are absolutely brilliant at doing that so again pause the video have a look around and see how many of these that you think you can actually use in your classroom and in your school to bring your classroom to life to make your classroom more digital and to really spruce up those notice boards um, you know if you can bring your notice boards to life and they can be interactive and they can be digital then that's brilliant the students are going to be so much more engaged um, than just looking at a picture on a board that's been there for, you know, for three or four months. Well, if you can constantly keep updating them with, uh, you know, with QR codes that link to fresh new digital content on the web, that's going to be brilliant. And I thought I'd leave you with one example. I could have put numerous examples here, but I didn't want this video to run too long. This is one example from um, from my school and the RE department within my school. What you'll see here is that on the um, on the right hand side there are all these pictures here relating to the topics in red on these posters here and then on each one there is a QR code uh, that if you scan one of these codes here you will be taken immediately to YouTube uh, and it will play a video of the um, of the topic in which the students can learn some more information uh, and get a better in-depth knowledge about the topic. Um, those um, those videos on, the, on on those QR codes there are actually videos from Newsround, so they're perfect for the um, for the age range um, that the um, that the department are trying to get across to. So there you go. That's it. Hopefully that has inspired you to uh, see about using QR codes in your school. Uh, maybe you've used them so far. Maybe you've got some different ideas now that you, you didn't have before. Um, maybe this is going to be a, a new project for you. But um, you know, bring your classroom to life. Uh, make your classroom digital. And happy scanning. If you want any more information, you can uh, contact me on Twitter at the bottom left, at Team Tate, or at the bottom right via my blog, edutate.com. Okay, thank you very much. Um, on the, if you actually... If you download a QR reader, and not, in all honesty, you don't actually need a QR reader if you've got a Google app, as I know most people do on their, on their iPhones. Um, actually, on Google app, there's, an iPhone, there's a QR reader. Uh, I think it's just a little camera icon. So rather than just typing in what you're searching for and then pressing enter, if you just click on the little camera icon, it'll bring up the QR reader. You can, the kids can scan it from the, um, the visual board, they can scan it from a resource, they can scan it through a glass as well, which is fantastic. Um, I, personally, I've got them in my classroom on my um, display board. I've got a lot of books that I would recommend to the kids. And if the kids scan on them, then it takes them to a review. Uh, it takes them to um, a website in the office. So it really does bring your, your display boards to life. So please do give it a go because it can be used so many, so many ways. The, the kids will need to obviously know how to access this, but in all honesty, the, the kids will be able to tell you how to do it. Most of them have got QR readers anyway. Um, so hopefully it's just something that you can have a little think about how you can use in the next week or so. Um, right, okay, the last thing, the last thing I want you to do is just, I'm, I'm going to tell you an idea really that actually has been kicking around for a very long time, it's called an exit ticket. Um, so your back page is your exit ticket. 
Um, this is a really nice activity to use in the class as they're leaving, especially if you run out of time for feedback. Uh, you, you want to really use some of those ideas for the next lesson. So the class would fill in uh, the answers to whatever it is that you, your questions, and then you just literally ask them to fold it over so it's anonymous and post it in a box on the way as they, uh, as they go out the door. And then you can have a little look before your next lesson, and obviously that will then shape you up for the next lesson. So I've got a few questions on here related to the teaching and learning takeover tonight. I'd like you to spend just a couple of minutes having a talk about things that you've seen what you would like to start using tomorrow, what you'd like to start using next week, what you've really taken from it and learned from this session, and then if you could just leave them as you leave uh, tonight. Thank you. Can I just say that you want to have to